Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday Art at Home. Uh, this is June 16th. It is our month, sponsored by the Hoboken Library, to honor LGBTQ American artists who have contributed such a huge amount to the culture of the United States of America. As with other classes that we have had in the past, I am going to start the class by talking about a specific artist. Today it is a male artist. We will look briefly at his work, talk a little bit about his life, and then you folks, I will be giving you an assignment and you will be free to create your own art. And I neglected to say my name is Liz, and I'm so delighted to have you all here with me today. I just want to briefly scroll through the attendees. I'm not seeing any new folks here today. Hello to everyone. Oh, I'm new. Oh, there's a new person. <laughs> Who is that? Lizzie. I'm Elizabeth as well. <laughs> so delighted to have another Liz amongst us. Welcome, welcome. Are you a Hoboken person? I am not. Is that allowed? It's absolutely allowed. We're thrilled to have you. We love people near and far. <laughs> and Lizzie, it doesn't matter what your skill level is. That's good. Um, we're happy to have you. Oh, thank you. You are so welcome. Usually we start with introductions so you can get to know everyone in the group, but we're starting a little late today, Lizzie, so forgive me no if problem. I skip right into our class. Yeah, so right our artists for, oh, and just a little housekeeping note, I do request that everyone keep their microphone muted. I do welcome comment, absolutely. Please, if you have stuff to say, you are welcome to unmute and share your thoughts, but particularly when we're busy working, please make an effort to stay muted because some artists need quiet in order to create. Some amongst us prefer having a quiet environment in which to work. All right, our artist for today is unfortunately a little known, under-recognized, wonderful artist named Beaufort Delaney. I'll put his name in the chat box. Where is my chat box? Seems to have disappeared. Here it is. Beaufort Delaney. Beaufort Delaney was a gay African-American artist. He had his heyday during the Harlem Renaissance, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. He was born December 30th, 1901, and he died March 26th, 1979. He was an American modernist painter, and as I mentioned before, he's most remembered for his work with the Harlem Renaissance in the 1930s and 40s. He did, in his later life, uh, he started practicing abstract expressionism. In fact, he was one of the first abstract expressionist artists in the world. So not only was he little known, it's a little known fact that he was one of the forerunners of abstract expressionism in Europe. He was uh, born in Knoxville, Tennessee, as I said, on December 30th, 1901. His parents were prominent members of the black community. Were prominent and respected members of the black community. His father was a barber and a Methodist minister. His mother was also a leader in the church. She was a laundress and a house cleaner for local white people. She had been born into slavery, but um, worked herself up. She was illiterate, unfortunately, but instilled in her family a, a sense of dignity and self-respect that Delaney credited her for 
his entire life. He he venerated her um, and honored her for his whole life. He was the eighth of ten children. He suffered from from uh, poverty and racism for his entire life. There was much sickness in his house. Uh, he had to walk long distances to school. His childhood was extremely difficult. Both he and his younger brother Joseph were attracted to art. Joseph was more of a musician and the outgoing uh, one in the artistic tradition in the family. Beaufort grew up to be quite an introspective, uh, deep person, very sensitive person. And when they were teenagers, they got to be helpers at a sign company where both he and Joseph began learning how to draw and create their own signs. And at that point in their life, they were noticed by Lloyd Branson, an American impressionist artist in Knoxville. Beaufort became Delaney's apprentice. And at 23, he encouraged Delaney to migrate to Boston. While in Boston, Delaney studied at the Massachusetts Normal School and the South Boston School of Art and the Copley Society. And uh, Beaufort attributes a lot of his training in what he called the classical technique for his years spent in Boston. He also got what he called the crash course in black activism and politics and ideas while he lived in Boston as well. He met such prominent radical African-Americans as James Weldon Johnson, William Monroe Trotter, and Butler Wilson, one of the members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. By 1929, he felt that he had reached the nadir of his skills in art education, and he decided to leave Boston and move to New York City. He arrived in New York City just at the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance, and that was terrific for him. That the, it was at the beginning of a cultural explosion, that was the upside. But the downside was it was also at the beginning of the Great Depression. So he was confronted with extreme poverty right at the time that he was finding his cultural grounding. What he did at that period of time, trying to, to gain a footing in the New York scene, was to start painting people that he saw living on the streets. I'm sorry, was that a question? No, I guess not. Please remember to mute, guys, unless you have a question or a comment. So members of this disenfranchised community became the subjects of many of Delaney's greatest New York period paintings. He painted colorful, engaging canvases that captured scenes of the urban landscapes. He worked in an American modernist vein, trying to capture not only the character of the city, but also his personal vision of equality, love, and respect among all people. He started to drop and abandon his expressive, his, his precise realistic style that he'd adopted in Boston when he was learning his, his artistic school skills through his academic training. And he was developing a very lyrical expressive style that drew upon his love for the people and for his love of musical rhythm. His colors became very kind of improvisational and, and brighter at this period of time. They became, his images became more abstract as the, they evolved during the 1940s. 
So the pressures of being black and gay in New York City were huge for Delaney. They affected his art, they affected his psyche, and they made life extremely difficult for him. He moved from Harlem down to the West Village because that's where he felt more comfortable as a gay individual. He also needed to escape the black community because gay life was not accepted amongst black people. And so he felt more at home amongst the white gay people that he lived with in the village. He did come frequently up to Harlem because it was the cultural life that drew him there. And he loved being in the jazz clubs. He loved going to the Harlem Artists Guild, but he, this is so interesting to me. He did not become part of the 306 group and the black artist scene of that time. He was incredibly proud at the same time, incredibly proud of being black. And he was pleased to participate in a number of black artists exhibitions with fellow artists like Jacob Lawrence, Romeo Bearden and other artists that we've spoken of before. He also showed with his brother, Joseph Delaney. Here's a quote about Delaney that I, I love. It's from, no, it's about Delaney. His painting seemed to say, I may be suffering, but what an experience this is. Delaney's work is never depressing. Though Beaufort is often depressed, he could say yes to life in spite of the fact that life was kicking him in the butt. Things got to be so difficult though for him in New York that in 1953, at the age of 52, he left and moved to Paris. And this was not unusual for black artists of, and cultural people of that time, artists and writers and musicians at that time. Many of them were escaping to Paris, including people like James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison. And um, Beaufort Delaney was kind of late in the game to leave New York and move to Paris. And in fact, Delaney um, lived out the rest of his life in Paris and died there. In Paris, his style completely shifted. He became intrigued by abstract expressionism and he made a rather dramatic shift away from figurative work into studies of color and light. Unfortunately, by 1961, his mental health really began deteriorating. He became quite paranoid. He returned to New York to see his family in 1969, but then went back to Paris and at that point in his life was greatly afflicted by early symptoms of Alzheimer's and deteriorated pretty rapidly at that point. In 1985, James Baldwin described the impact of Delaney on his life, saying he was the first living proof for me that a black man could be an artist. In a warmer time, a less blasphemous place. He would have been recognized as my master and I as his pupil. He became for me an example of courage and integrity, humility and passion, an absolute integrity. I saw him shaken many times and I lived to see him broken, but I never saw him bow. So they were great friends, James Baldwin and Beaufort Delaney. In fact, Delaney for many years was Baldwin's mentor and father. I mean, Baldwin often called him his father figure. There was some conjecture that they might've been lovers, but it probably was not the case. 
So Delaney's work, I'm going to finish with this, has been exhibited at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Harvard U University Art Museums, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Knoxville Museum of Art, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, the Newark Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And I've seen his portrait of James Baldwin at the Met. I actually think the Met might own that portrait, but I'm not positive. All right, any com comments on his life before I start sharing his work? I'm thrilled. I see many of you are already working. Gosh, I haven't even given the assignment yet. And some of you are already at work. All right. So for those of you who don't know the agenda of our classes or who may have forgotten, I now want to start sharing images of Beaufort Delaney's work. Hmm, I'm having a small, oh, here it is. Never mind. I could not find my file with his images. Here we go. Choosing which painting to start with. Let's look at this one. I'm going to share the screen. And try and keep in mind the period of time that in which Delaney was creating his work. Unfortunately, this is horribly pixelated when I enlarge it. And remember, I mean, he did have some formal training, but for the most part, he was almost self-taught. But I find his work to be quite sensitive. There's a lot of feeling in his work. I think that this is a self-portrait with perhaps his model. I'm not sure, his model or student with him here on the sofa. Sorry, everyone. Getting a lot of crank calls today. So you can see the, the large influence of Impressionism on his work, I think. Some really interesting flat areas of color. The edge of this bureau here kind of catches my eye. Flat and dark. And then this flat door also. Very interesting flat plane of color. But then he has these textured areas in the background as well. Really nice depth. His use of perspective going back into space is quite wonderful. It really helps with the foreshortening of the legs and the figures here. The proportions are not accurate, so he's approaching realism, but this image is not what I would call realistic, much more impressionistic. So this fits with the style of artists of this period of time, what is called American modernism. 
The colors are very soft and muted, nothing too bright. Is it pastel or? No, I'm guessing this is oils. Oil? Yes. He was primarily a painter. Let's look at a few more and then I'm going to give you our assignment for today. So this is going to pixelate badly too, but again, so this is probably an earlier work. Um, he spent much of the time in the 30s painting images of people in and around Harlem. This image is very flat compared to the other one we looked at. Except for the red clothing on this person, the palette is still very muted. It's kind of a very lonely picture, isn't it? Desolate. So now we're going to look at a portrait. Everyone see this one? So this is a portrait. I'm not sure who it is. It could be a self portrait. Part of me wants to say Romare Bearden because of the hat, but it doesn't look like Bearden. Starting to be way more expressive though in the color area. And I feel like there's way more confidence in his technique and application of paint. Love the texture in this one. Okay. Another. Yes. So um, where where would one see uh, Belford Delaney's work? Is it? Is... Well, at the moment, I'm not sure. But he, I believe his portrait of James Baldwin is either owned by the Met or MoMA. You would have to do a little research on that. Is this Jane? Was that James yes. who asked me? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'm not yes. sure. I did see his portrait of James Baldwin in a show about African American art history. I think it was at the Met, but it was at least five or more years ago. So he's not shown a lot, unfortunately. Mm. And and what was the what were his prolific years 
Like, like how old was he when he was painting? You know? Well, he, he painted from the 1920s until almost until his, his, the onset of Alzheimer's, which was really in the 1970s. So, wow. Early 1970. 1970 began to display early symptoms of Alzheimer's. So, even when the mental illness started, um, the work has to me the equality of innocence. Huh. Why? The um, just the, the way, like, just sort of the bluntness of it, and the the colors, the combination of colors, very soft and muted. Not a lot of like intentional striking um, statements in my in my thinking. Okay. Okay, I'm remuting. I like your comment. This one I think is a very beautiful portrayal of this person. Again, I have no idea who it is. Is it a self portrait? Is it? I believe that's a self portrait of him. I was looking at pictures of him. Okay, thank you. I like the forward gaze, the very deliberate looking out at us, very direct, honest gaze. Love the background color. Again, I feel deep emotion in this picture as well. All right, we're gonna end with one or more of his most famous model. So this is the painting I saw at the Met. So this is James Baldwin. You can see the, the influence of abstraction in his work now is becoming very strong. I love the volume of the neck, the sturdiness and power of Baldwin's neck in this image. It makes the whole head look monumental and sculptural. Exactly. And then the white, the white behind the head also gives power to the face. But the, the eyes are vacant, right? To me, there's kind of a vacant empty quality almost. Not necessarily. Yes? I said not necessarily. Okay, good. What what feeling are you getting, Nomi? Curiosity. Um, okay. I wouldn't call them vacant. I don't know, but it's totally personal. Of course. It's interesting how he's both sculptural and flat at the same time. So you have the, the flatness of um, the blue um, triangular shape, you have the sculptural of the neck, and then different things are different kind of. So that kind of contrast makes it really interesting. It does. And I think this black outline is really what's creating some of the flat quality. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It has kind of a Van Gogh feeling to it for me too. And maybe that's the heavy dark outline that's giving me that Van Gogh kind of feeling. I just love it. It's, it's like he's carved Baldwin's face out of wood. I mean, maybe like Picasso, he'd been looking at some African masks before he'd started this portrait. Or oh, it's like a bust. It is, it's like a carved bust. It's really, really a beautiful portrait. I love how the, the whole face, the whole portrait fills the page, but his head is completely running off the top edge. Gives it a power and immediacy, and an immediacy as well. Nomi, I'm I'm seeing what you see now. The the kind of popping of the eyes too gives it that kind of joyous curiosity feeling. Thank you for helping me to see that. So welcome, who am I? <laughs> yeah. That's the, the really nice thing about talking about art with other people. You get to hear different points of view. All right, there, he did many portraits of Baldwin. Let's look at just one more and then we're gonna go to work. It's helpful to, to have an artist who's done multiple portraits of the same person because you can see how one artist can approach the same subject in different ways. I think that's a really helpful thing. When we were looking at Hockney the other week, I hope that was helpful as well. Although I'm seeing just now there's a signature on this. You know what? I'm thinking this is not by Beaufort Delaney. Shoot. But isn't it a great portrait of Baldwin? All right. This is not by Delaney, forgive me. But it's, I think this artist was looking at Delaney's portrait. What do you think? Yes. It's a beautiful portrait. All right, we're gonna stop that share. I think I may have one more of Delaney's. Something, and that's important to note that on the internet, you can frequently fall into a place where it's easy to be deceived by the provenance of work. Rabbit hole of misinformation. There you go. Yeah, no, I don't have another one. But here, here's, a, here's, this is an interesting juxtaposition. I'm gonna show you this image that I also took off the internet. because there's a photograph of Baldwin in it. And it's this other artist's work. Here's Baldwin. This could be Delaney with Baldwin. And then this other artist's work. And I think this is one of Delaney's later abstractions. So there you go. We're going to end our discussion of Delaney with this confusing picture. <laughs> All right. So Beaufort Delaney, he had a tough life. He was under-recognized. As with many artists, he's gained fame after his death. 
if you do get a chance ever to see his work, I really recommend that you do. We are going to do portraits again this week. Um, so the materials that you will need are paper, pencil, and any other drawing equipment that you would like to use. Those of you who are my veteran students, if you are feeling uh, interested and up to it and inspired today, I would like you to work in color as well. I would recommend you sketch first in pencil and then work in color on top of your pencil sketch. And my more advanced students, I'm gonna give you a tough assignment today, although I see many of you have started working already. I want you to try a self-portrait today. And here's how you can do a self-portrait. Take a selfie on your cell phone and work from that, unless you're lucky enough to have a mirror nearby and you can work from life. As always, I prefer that you work from life. It's much better to have a living image to work from. You can be much more accurate in your drawing than you can be from a photo. Now, Lizzie, have you ever drawn faces before? Yes. Okay, cool. I have another option for those of you who are not feeling in the mood for doing realistic portraits today in the style of Beaufort Delaney or being inspired by Beaufort Delaney. I thought it might be a fun challenge today to instead of trying to do a realistic self-portrait, you could find an object or a photo that represents yourself and create a portrait about that object. So for example, you all know about my childhood doll, Hazel. If I were to choose the second option in portrait making, I might choose to do a portrait of her rather than a portrait of my own face. Or I might combine the two. So there are three options today. You could try and do a realistic portrait of your own face. You could do a more abstract, kind of emotive image of an object that symbolizes yourself, or you could do a combination of the two things, the object that symbolizes yourself plus your own face. Any questions? Dead silent, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. All right, I'm gonna give everybody a couple minutes to gather up all your materials. I'm gonna pull my easel closer to my laptop screen. I am gonna to opt to do the third project. I'm gonna try and do a self-portrait of my own face. I'm not gonna do a selfie. I'm gonna look at my laptop screen and try and draw from life from my own screen. I guess you could do that as well, couldn't you? You could spotlight your own face on your uh, desktop or laptop screen and draw from life. That didn't even occur to me till just this second. And I'm gonna try and combine my portrait with a portrait of my beloved Hazel. You do not have to watch me. And Lizzie, especially for you, because you've never taken my classes before, I prefer that you don't watch me. You can watch on and off, particularly if you're a little rusty at portrait work, if you want to see the way I start drawing a portrait for the basics and then go about doing your own thing. 
but I want you to do your own expression today and explore your own style and relax and have fun. Okay, I don't have um, too much experience, but are we supposed to try to emulate his style? You don't have to emulate anybody. Mm -hmm. I show the other artists work as inspiration mm -hmm. and you can get ideas from his style, but you do not have to copy his work. I want you to do your own thing. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> Now, when I start doing my portrait, I'm going to quietly talk about the steps that I take when mm. I do portraits. So I'm hoping that will help you. Okay. Yeah. I'm interested to see that. Good. I usually, if you had started with us at the beginning of June, I go through everything about the proportions of the human face. I'm not going to do that with, I usually do it with yes. diagrams and things. I'm not going to do that today, but I will talk about it while I'm drawing my portrait today. How's that? That's good. Um, is that recorded, the original June? They are all recorded, yes. Hmm. So where would I be? Am I able to access that? Yes. I believe if you go to YouTube mm -hmm. and, you, and you type in Hoboken Library, you can mm -hmm. find all of the lessons. Unfortunately, though, there may be a delay, you know, like they may not have loaded all the June lessons thus mm -hmm. far. No problem. So you'll have to investigate that. Okay. I will tell you this, I'll put it, I'm gonna put in the chat box to you places where you can find the diagram that we used. And Lizzie, if you want, if you just uh, put in the chat box to me, you don't have to send it to everyone. You can put your email address. I can start sending you information. Yeah. And every week I send an email out to everyone in the class, information about the artist for the following week and materials that you'll need for the next class. Yeah. So right now I'm putting in the chat box what you can do to find the diagrams that we've been using. And you can do that right now if you want. You can. Well, I'd like to see how you approach it because I just draw, but I've never really taken art classes. So I'm curious on how people approach things. I'm putting the name of a book that's very helpful as well. Mm. Okay, so if you check the chat box, Lizzie, you'll get some information. Thank you. You're so welcome.
Now, as always, I recommend that you draw first in pencil in portraiture. I am going to draw using black Sharpie so that you can see what I'm doing. Not really the best tool to use, particularly if you want to use color. If you're just drawing in black and white, Sharpie, of course, is terrific to use. Um, but if you want to use paint or pastel to color your portrait, I would not start with Sharpie. All right, I think everybody's probably set up by now. As always, even drawing my own face, I'm gonna start with a basic shape, the oval. I like to draw large. The larger you draw, the more room for error you have. And all artists make mistakes. And that's a good thing. All right. I'm going to draw my guidelines in pencil, however, so that I'll be able to erase them afterwards. You may not be able to see my guidelines, but I'm going to talk about them. The guidelines for the eyes are halfway down my oval. And I forgot to mention, of course, the human head is symmetrical. Boom, if I took a power saw and cut myself in half, it would be the same on both sides. So I'm gonna draw a guideline, the vertical guideline down the middle of my face. The next guideline will be halfway between the eye guideline and the chin. That's for the bottom of my nose. And the third and final guideline, which unfortunately I don't think you can see because of the position of my laptop. Let's see if I can put it up a bit higher. Let's see if that works. No, that makes it worse. If lowering it helps. No. Now, there doesn't appear to be a way for you to see the entire picture I'm working on. Sorry, Lizzie. But the third and final guideline that I'm making is halfway between the bottom of the nose and the chin. And I'm already seeing my first mistake. I think my nose guideline is a little bit low. So I'm gonna erase that and put it up higher. just a little bit higher. There we go. All right, I like to start with the eyes. They are unique and different to every human face. And I'm gonna work on the eyebrows. One of the disadvantages with not having a mirror and working from my laptop screen is my face is kind of small. But here we go. Starting with my brows, the shape 
of each individual's brow is different. I don't have much brows at all. The brow goes almost the whole length of the eye. Mine is pretty much obscured by my big eyeglass frame, however. Those of you who have eyeglasses, I encourage you to keep them on while you're drawing because they will help you with the proportions of the face. If you notice on my eyeglasses, the bottom part of the frame hits the nostrils of my nose. That's a big help when I draw. Okay, and Lizzie and everyone else, this is a review for all of you. The proportions of the human face can be measured by eye length. So Lizzie, you might wanna look at the screen for a minute. If I took the eraser end of my pencil and put it on the inside of my eye and then put my fingers on the outer corner of my eye and that will be one eye length. There are some interesting things that happen. My nose is one eye length. My mouth, it's a little, this is hard to do on screen, but my mouth is a little bit longer than one eye length. Incredible, right? The distance between my eyes is an eye length. If I were to drop my pencil straight down from my pupil, it's a straight drop to the outer corner of my mouth. If I drop the straight line down from the inner corner of my eye, it hits the side of the nose. The top of my ears, right at the level of my eyes and the bridge of my nose. The bottom of my ear is the bottom of my nose. So the ear fits in what I call the eye-nose corridor of the face. And all those things are helpful measuring tools for drawing proportions. So, because I have these big glasses, I'm gonna draw them next. They really do define my face. So here we go. Elizabeth, is that true proportions to a child as well? No, in children, it's different. Children have much bigger crowns to their heads mm -hmm. as the brain develops this area of the head is much larger. The eyes are lower on, the, on children's heads. So that was a good question. If you are doing a portrait of an infant, check that out. You'll notice that the forehead is quite large. Mm. Interesting. Glad you asked that question. And one error of error, particularly amongst new artists, is in the crown of the head. We frequently forget to leave this space. Forehead space is much bigger than we realize. And it's important to notice that space because if you don't put it in your portrait, the image tends to look very kind of cartoony which is okay if you're doing a caricature, that's a beautiful, fine way to draw. But if you're shooting for a realistic portrait, you want to be aware of the size of the forehead. Those of you who I've taught in person, you're, you're more than used to me saying, oh, you need more on top, add more hair. And that's because the crown of the head is much bigger than most people realize. Lizzie, was it you who called me Elizabeth? 
Yes. Yeah, only my mother calls me Elizabeth. Oh, me too. <laughs> and only when she was furious at me. Me too. <laughs> that's that's funny. Mm -hmm. So noticing where the eyeglass fits on my face is really important, like I said before. It really helps me see the length of my nose in relation to the rest of my face. Eyeglasses are really terrific when you're drawing portraits. And I'm drawing lightly in pencil. Not good for you folks to be able to see what I'm doing. I apologize, but I will go over it and make it darker momentarily. Huh, this is so interesting. Another problem I'm facing is because I'm looking down at my laptop. It's really distorting the size of everything. So in fact, my glasses are much, much bigger than the way I've actually drawn them. love challenges like that. And that's why I love the big pink eraser, everybody.
So remember our tip about doing the nose, try and use as little line as possible. I'm working on my nose now. The way the light is coming in through my window, um, the sunlight is hitting me on the right side of my face. On the screen, it looks like it's on the left side. And the left side of my nose is in shadow. So I am modeling the left side of the nose with shadow. I like to do my shading with the side of my pencil when I'm doing portrait work. If you outline the nose, it flattens it. And if you're going for a realistic portrait, you don't want to do that. Outlining again will kind of create more of a comic-y, cartoony image, which again is a great way to draw, but not if you want a realistic portrait. You'll see more shadow at the ball of the nose, this area here that I'm pointing to. One side will probably be in more shadow than the other. Number two pencil is the best for this kind of work because it's soft and easy to rub when you're doing shading. Don't go too heavy on the nostrils. Coloring in the nostrils, solid dark ovals again will not make it look real. It will give it that comic cartoon look. Just add your shadow, start light, get darker as you go. All right, lips. I have very thin almost flat lips, not much color. Oh, I'm just, just giving a slight impression of where my mouth is. Again, I'm using very little line, just shadow, basically shading. Darker in the middle where the lips separate And that's about it. Okay, I'm gonna go back and I left, uncharacteristically, I left my eyes till the end in this portrait and that's because of the eyeglasses. Remember I said I wanted to use the glasses as a measuring tool and because of that, it makes it a little more challenging to, to get in there to do the eyes. So now I'm gonna get back in there to do them. They are quite small in relationship to the lenses of my glasses, but here we go. Doing the upper lid first as always. My eyes look very dark behind the lens. It's almost completely black. 
Don't forget to color in the retina. Even if you have light blue eyes, the retina of the eye is colored. It is not white. And remember that the upper lid partially covers the retina. You don't see the white of the eye all the way around. And then don't forget the pupil, the black, little black circle in the middle, but you wanna leave that patch of light where the sunlight is reflected. Okay, don't forget the lower lid. A few short lashes. The lashes on the upper lid grow to the side, except in the middle, where you can indicate that with very short dark lines pointing up and out. You might want to put in the little tear duct in the inner corner of the eye if you can see it. A lot of shadow here because of the glass lens. So it's very dark here. Bigger. Notice how big the retina is, the colored part of the eye. It's probably way bigger than you even realize. You see much less of the white of the eye, much more of the retina. The other eye for me is incredibly challenging because I can barely see it because of the lens of my eyeglass. So let's see how we do. It's just really a black smudge.
Everybody good? Gosh. The time is flying. started adding some graphite to my portrait for the darker areas. Now I'm going to start plugging in the wrinkles. People often ask me about wrinkles. You need to start with very light shading first. Don't go too dark with those wrinkles. They'll start to look like, I don't know, ditches. If you want it to approach realism, start light. Think about wrinkles kind of almost like folds in fabric. That's basically what it is. Our skin is kind of our fabric that's getting softer with age. And I'm also going to start changing the shape of my head as it's much narrower than the original oval I made. And that's okay. That frequently happens in the drawing process. I 
I don't think I'm going to get to the hazel part of my picture. I'm disappointed. Here are the furrows between my eyes. I forgot, are these the crow's feet or the crow's feet are under your eyes? Starting light with those wrinkles. And always go darker. around my mouth. Multiple wrinkles around my mouth. side of my head is in extreme shadow. see my ears to indicate where they are.
So we have about 10 more minutes. I'll move my portrait back, then maybe you can, you know, you see less when I move it back, not more. What if I do this? Oh. There we go. A little better. Nope. Worse. There you go, that's close to my finished portrait. I'm looking <clears throat> at the shape of my face in the screen. The shape of my face in the drawing is still not correct. I need to work more on that. I think the features are getting there, but it's a work in progress. You see the way the glasses really aided me in doing the proportions correctly. But the area I want to work on more is here. This, this is not quite right. All right, a few more minutes and we'll stop to share and learn about the artist for next week.
All right, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the creative process. It's quite a rough. I just want to let you know that our artist for next week will be the late, great Robert Rauschenberg. Um, we will not be doing portraits next week, but we will be creating what are called assemblage. And Robert Rauschenberg made ginormous assemblage. We are gonna be doing small ones. Uh, here is a short list of things that you might want to collect. If you have a, sh a shoe box or any other small box, any found objects you have around your home that you think have interesting shapes and textures. Um, you're gonna need some kind of glue, probably Elmer's glue would be the best, Elmer's wood glue. And if you have paints, you might wanna use paint. And I think that that's it. So assemblage, I'm gonna put that in the chat box too. I put Rauschenberg's name in the chat box and assemblage are what we're gonna make. Found objects and a small box and Elmer's glue are the materials that you wanna have. Or if you have a hot glue gun, that'll work. So it's gonna be a little break from the intense work we've been doing with portraiture. All right. I will be sending out an email later uh, on the weekend to keep you informed and to remind you about all that. But in the meantime, those of you who are interested, you can just Google Robert Rauschenberg. There is a lot of information about him. Anyone wanna share? And a reminder, sharing is the time for us to give advice and suggestions. It is not a traditional critique period. We're not here to tell people what they've done wrong. We're here to offer suggestions about what they might do to enhance their work. 